Thrifty Wednesday. <laughs> uh, it is me, your host, Sapphire Sandalo, and it is Wednesday, which means it is Ouija Wednesday. Wow, I'm really bad at introductions. This is me stalling for time while people show up. Um, so I'm really excited <laughs> about my guest tonight. My guest is um, just like a really chill person. <laughs> Like, I feel like every single conversation I've had with this guy has, like, been super deep, super enlightening, and I'm totally, like, hyping up this conversation now, <laughs> and it's going to be a mess later. No, I was kidding. Um, he is the producer of the Euphemet podcast, which is an amazing paranormal podcast. Highly recommend. Uh, please give it up for Mr. Jim Perry. Hello, Jim. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much. And what an introduction. And I, 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 I am sure that we can follow up that caliber of hype. Okay, good. I don't yeah. like, am I hyping this up too much? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm extremely tired this week. I have nothing left in the tank, but I'm like kind of speedball with caffeine and like allergy medication. So it's going to be, I don't know if it's going to be enlightening. But it's it's going to be weird. It'll be so. something. <laughs> <laughs> um, so why don't we start with talking about what types of projects you are currently doing, or what types of stuff you have done? Yeah, Maybe from the past and then then the present. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, I've always been in, uh, interested and entertained and enthused by the paranormal and supernatural and the stories of those and the belief system that is not seemingly required, but sometimes I believe is inherited in those that are so interested in this phenomenon. And so I, you know, how do you do that? How do you become a part of the paranormal community? Uh, I didn't know any other way than something like a podcast. Thankfully, I had training in broadcasting and I had training in uh, media development and creative development through sort of a past life slash sort of current life as a creative director in the advertising agency world. Ooh. And, you know, you just take all those fun things that you learn by, you know, burning the midnight oil for some client who doesn't give a shit about your work. And <laughs> you take that and you just put it over here to the stuff you love at some point in time. And uh, that's what Euphemet is. It's an expression of my deep um, curiosity, right? Like my deep fascination with the wonderment that seemingly is around us. And it's something that, you know, recently I discovered was uh, a very important part of my personal story. You know, I grew up in a household where belief systems uh, revolving around psychic ability and Sasquatch and even extraterrestrials and stuff. We're, we're just, it was just like, yeah, that's probably, that's probably true. It wasn't ever uh, frowned upon. It wasn't ever like sort of, I was never dissuaded. And there were, you know, I have many personal anecdotes about that type of activity happening in my family. And so when I uh, revisited that space as a, as an adult, going, oh my God, you know, over the last 15 to 20 years, there was a lot of seemingly programming that tried to make me fit into a certain type of personality mm -hmm. and really jurisdict what I was supposed to be passionate about and what was real and what wasn't. Needless to say, as I explored that rabbit hole and remembered myself through it, that's where I am today. Yeah. Making a, making a podcast featuring, uh, you know, the, um, the very personal paranormal stories, uh, the very personal relationship that people have with the unknown. And I do that in a documentary form. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of my main job today. Amazing. <laughs> How long have you been doing Euphemet? I think Euphemet started in its first incarnation in 2014, I believe. And at okay. that time it was a, it was a straight up, uh, podcast interview show. Uh, I then transferred to a live radio show with a low power FM station in Seattle. And so I was on in like the Capitol Hill and first Hill neighborhood. I had like the late night slot on, I think it was like Thursdays or something. And that was fantastic because it was the first time I started to experience call-ins and, you know, like the wacky callers that would have these wild impassioned stories 
And uh, it's the first time I started getting like the the courage to not just be sort of like entertained and influenced and inspired by it, but the calling to kind of go out further, visit these places that I hear so much about, uh, you know, meet and, uh, you know, adventures with these people that have been featured like within my eardrums via radio and podcast for decades. And that was the birth of the documentary version of the show. You know, like my influences aren't just like paranormal stuff. Like I'm a big Uh fan of public radio shows and, you know, um, This American Life and Snap Judgment. And at that time, Serial was going on as well. And so long form documentary storytelling like that was really great. And so I said, you know, there's no one doing this for like the supernatural and the paranormal Uh at that time. And um, I just took some of those tools. I adapted what I knew about documentary filmmaking into an audio process and that's where it is today uh since 2018 i believe it's been in this documentary format and it's been uh so much fun i mean i can't it's like i um my vocabulary completely fails me when i try to (laughs) sort of demonstrate how much i feel about the show and how fun it is and how uh, fucking horrible i feel right now that i can't go do it so Right, because your show relies heavily on travel, which unfortunately, yeah, that that must be a huge bummer. Um, well, I would love to know, you know, like you have spoken with so many people, meet so many people, hear so many stories. Um, is there a particular story or like group of people that you have encountered that really sticks with you above all of the rest? Hmm. That's a, that's a really profound and challenging question to answer. <laughs> um, because, because I suppose in, in some ways there are those favorites, mm-hmm. but they're, they're certainly for like sort of different reasons. So I, have a, right. so I have a bunch of different favorites. I would say that, I would say that like some of the most, some of the deepest connections that I have with individuals are actually like really being expressed post the documentary show. And I'll explain in this way, like I'm having so many interesting conversations with the individuals that I either featured or have created other works with during the documentary phase in this time when I can't do it that way anymore. So Mm -hmm. so I'm bringing friends like yourself, like on to night drift to be like co-host and then we enter in these giant text conversations and then, you know, I'll have conversations that extend into synchronicities with friends that I've either either sort of featured on the show or that is now a part or a contributor in some way for the interview series night drift that we're doing. And so some of the most profound relationships are coming now after, after we've had an opportunity to sort of like break bread together. Uh, There's a level of trust that is granted, I think, in that relationship, because I think, I mean, I think for, for what it's worth, I'm pretty non-judgmental, or at least I try to be, I try to be very open mm-hmm. and I try to be very honest with, uh, all of my relationships. So I, th- I think there's something that, that bridges the gap there where it's like the work seemingly is never done. So I'll feature someone and it seems like, well, that was a feature that we did then, but let's keep the conversation going because there's going to be something else. There's going to be something more. So I've, I've been very privileged about that. I don't think I'm answering the question the way (laughs) you're hoping I would, because I'm not including any sort of like wild experiences or anything that I've had because I've had a ton of those as well. I mean, there was, there's been times when I thought that I was like in physical danger. There were times doing the show that I thought I was like spiritual danger. If that exists, there were times doing the show when I was so fucking out of my mind feeling that I turned to, you know, visiting witchcraft shops to try to collect talismans and stuff, because if energy does exist, I felt like I was experiencing energies at that moment that I'd never experienced before. You know, I've seen ghosts and unknown lit craft, um, Sasquatch craft. What is that? So, you know, UFOs or UAP or whatever it may be. Uh Um, just wait, what's UAP? Uh, so, so yeah, so that's a uh, unidentified aerial phenomenon. And that is like the, 
that's like sort of the new that's like the new hip nomenclature <laughs> for you, I think. interesting yeah, yeah, yeah. okay i didn't know that yeah, yeah. so it, yeah so so that term adopted by the government essentially in their programs studying like through the department of Dis defense and the pentagon studying that uh movement they sort of uh gave it a different name in which they like to do sometimes i look so tired on this thing i'm what? just like looking no. at <laughs> i just look like just like michael madsen after a bender <laughs> i'm just um you look I'm sorry I, i'm having like uh, like i'm having such bad allergies this week sapphire it's ridiculous like I, like we like my wife and i will go for walks during the day and like uh -huh. it'll be like 10 in the morning we'll go like let's take the dog for a walk and the other day like i couldn't even do it i tapped out before i even went because i was like i don't think i can go out there like i was like crying and i was all like messed up oh, so no. are you, you just like is it like general allergies like allergic to the world <laughs> yeah allergic to the world for sure just probably allergic to all the bullshit <laughs> oh, going on exactly hey yeah. i mean um, that's a thing yeah I right <laughs> So, um, yeah, sorry. Sorry. I look just hideous <laughs> here tonight. You look um, great. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, just, uh, were you, did you, were you in the middle of answering a question or were you done? <laughs> I don't know. I think I was done. Okay. I think I was just, that's it. <laughs> We're off to a great start here, folks. Mm -hmm. um, oh, Lucic Regard says, I feel bad for you, Jim. Well, you've got, Thank you. you've got some empathizers. Sympathizers? Empathizers there yeah. in, the, in the audience for you. Thank you. Thank um, you so much. So let me see. I know there is something I want to ask. Well, okay. You had mentioned that you are doing a lot of research, um, learning about a lot of new stuff. What types of stuff are you currently researching? Is there anything that is particularly standing out to you or striking you as like, I got to learn more about this? Mm. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, I think like I'm really into, I'm really into a couple things right now and it's really reflected in the night drift programming, I think, because they keep uh -huh. coming up and I feel kind of bad about it because it's sort of like, here we go again, the same topic that Jim is obsessed with at this moment, but what I'm obsessed it? with I'm obsessed with Randonautica. And <gasps> oh, I would love to talk about that. Yeah, so it's interesting effects, possibly, and what it's showing us about uh, things like, um, you know, sort of non-local consciousness. Secondly, I'm really interested about non-local consciousness. I'm interested in any, like, sort of research going on or that has gone in the past that demonstrates our abilities to connect with non-human inhabitants, perhaps, or other energies that take on different modalities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the cryptid or the UFO or the ghost of uh, the out-of-body experience, the near-death experience, the hallucinogenic state these things being just different modalities for different non-local consciousness and that they're interconnected and that perhaps there's something ultra terrestrial about those. So those are the things that I've been kind of like into, I've been into uh, researching like the very early remote viewing programs. Mm -hmm. I've been researching like crazy and just like ongoing researching sort of Jack Parsons and uh, the occult influences into rocket technology. Uh, I'm very interested right now in uh, sort of like the ethics of paranormal investigation mm -hmm. um, in its relationship to mental health and what we can learn from mental health professionals in terms of helping uh, mediate or uh, create a space where people you know, having this, these anomalous experiences actually have an opportunity to get foundational help and treatment as well, especially if the, the, the phenomenon, um, broaches over into a physiological or physical type condition. Right. Um, I think that's really hard for me. I don't know about you. I'd be interested in, this is like really getting deep real quick, but you know, like a lot of people tell us their stories. Yeah. Right. And, Sometimes the, uh, in the most earnest way, friends or acquaintances will ask, well, how do you know that person's telling the truth? 
Yeah, people ask that all the time. Right? And mm -hmm. I'll usually say, well, you know, I don't know if it matters so much as like how much they believe in their story and how much I believe in their story. Mm -hmm. because uh, at the end of the day, so much of this, we're not going to be able to prove like you and I, we're not going to be able to be like, we busted it. We figured <laughs> out the mystery of the earth. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Let us explain reality to you real quick. Um, <laughs> so, you know, a lot of it is like, just, I don't know, using our gut and our intellect and our spidey senses and our empathy to try to, uh, to try to help, care for those people passionately while they're displaying sometimes these very personal stories. What concerns me about that sometimes and always should probably be at the top of mind, maybe is there are folks out there that also are having like incredible challenges with different types of disorders. Mm -hmm. And I'm not one to diagnose anyone either. Right. You know, just as I'm not to like say who's telling the truth or not, there's also some of that going on in there. So for me, for the amount of stories that I hear, for the amount of people that I talk to on a daily basis through email or social media or whatever else, you know, I want to like, I want to make sure that there's a place for these folks to go to just talk to a professional too. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to take advantage of people if they're really, um, you know, it, here's the things like both things can be true. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I know I struggle with, uh, you know, an anxiety disorder. I think like I have a tendency to be a little manic sometimes. Like I probably have ADHD. Um, there's all these things that a lot of us work through and are challenged by, but we find ways to like go through that process. And sometimes one of those ways is talking to a therapist or a mental health professional. And for, uh, and, and that's exactly like, and that's writing the line, right? Like that's like exploring the unknown and seeing weird shit all the time and trying to justify it to yourself and be unbiased at the same time. But I, I would love for other individuals to feel okay that yes, you can experience ghost-like activity, right? Like you can perhaps, who am I to say? You're able to channel, you're able to possess psychic abilities, uh, all of these things while also having it possible that you could suffer from, a, a, you know, some sort of mental disorder as well, or a mental challenge or like what, whatever it may be. I, I don't have the right nomenclature of the language right now. So I apologize for that. But I want to like, I would love to create a space where both of those things can be true. Right. And, y you know, I think it's really needed in this space as we're, as we're continuing to look uh, deeper and closer at how we move through the world. Um, you know, like it, 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 it is also like creating a space where more people can speak on things that aren't just a bunch of white cis people, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of these type of issues that are not like sort of, I'm not saying that I'm the flag bearer for that and everything else, but I'm just trying to be a conscious creator. Like, yeah, like all other industries have already had to do and have been grappling with these topics and figuring out how they can work together to better themselves. I don't feel paranormal is in that space at all yet. And it feels mm -mm. like so regressive and so dirty and so ugly. Keep saying the same shit over and over yeah. again. And it's like, let's just, let's work together on this and make it better. You know, okay. So actually, I don't know if you know, but I'm on this show on the Travel Channel called Paranormal Caught on Camera. And basically what we do is we react to clips that they share with us. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, hang on. I have to like pause because I'm like, how much should I say? Yeah. Um, well, I will I say this as you're thinking about it. My mother-in-law, I told you before, oh, like her favorite yeah. show. <laughs> yeah. So I watch it with her Yay. and it's great. <laughs> yeah. And I think you're great on it too. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, it's so funny because every time I watch it, I'm like, I, I don't know. I think I sound dumb. Anyways. <laughs> so, okay. I bring it up because a lot of the clips that they send us, a lot of the time, they will kind of play into stereotypes. Like a lot of the clips are people going into abandoned mental asylums, abandoned hospitals, stuff like that. Um, and then like, you know, they'll include like the background on the place and they'll ask us, you know, like some questions and stuff. And especially with the haunted asylums, those are the ones that really get me because when they, I don't know, I just feel like they're perpetuating those stereotypes of like, 
oh, it's so much scarier because of all of the ghosts who are mentally unwell. Mm -hmm. And it's like, hang on a second. I don't want to be villainizing or demonizing um, people who have mental health issues um, any more than we like, we already are doing that, like yeah. in our yeah. media and culture. So it's like, it, I, when I first started the show, I was I was sort of just like excited to like be a part of it. But I think the longer I'm on it, the more I'm like, okay, I actually like have kind of this responsibility to mm. make sure that I like e whether or not they use my piece about it, because um, you know they have the choice to edit like, the shit I say. Um, but like, it's my responsibility to at least say like, hey, I don't think that we should like talk about this like this. Um, which is like kind of cool. Cause they, they do use that like sometimes. Um, yeah. but I feel, I call myself like the, the ghost sympathizer. Cause like everything, all my reactions are always like, can we leave these ghosts alone? Can we stop just barging into places and yelling at them? Right. Because it's right, just like, right. well, yeah. I mean like it's, it's so just like anything it's complex, right. Mm -hmm. And it's not black and white. It, 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 in some regards, I really agree with you know, my, my friend, Tim, uh, the, he's a non-dual shamanic healer. And there's a lot of things about non-dualism that really jive with me and my interpretation of like, sort of. What is non-dualism? Have you mentioned this I, before? I, mean, I don't think so. I mean, it's basically just that fun fundamentally, like as simple as like, there is context. There's not, it's not black and white, right? Like, the, and many things can be true. It's, it's the idea of non-separation, that one can be striving to be enlightened while also using their ego as a tool, right? So, like, there, there is, um, I think there's a place in the conversation for things like that. And that, you know, I don't think it, any of the shit is going to be, like, sort of perfect overnight. But I think you're right in that at least these conversations can happen and we can, like, start talking about them. And again, like, I don't know. Like, I don't want to get to a space where we... Um, let me think about how you want to say this because it's really important, but I, but it's also like, we're going through this right now. So we're just trying to like figure out the best way forward. And I'm like thinking about what you said about that show. And I think that like empathy and intention is like what I want to get to with that. Because mm -hmm. considering that like multiple things can be true at one time, I think context, empathy, and intention is so important in this work. Because obviously, if there's a ghost-like energy that is present and that just like everything else in our sort of reality is jurisdicted by cultural construct, social construct, as we are, maybe it's because there's a interactivity between us and the ghost itself, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's maybe even a level of projection that's in there. They will, they, they sort of live within whatever our expectations are in some way, in some form or fashion. So in that way, they're connected or they're tied to seemingly our level of reality in terms of what our expectations are. If that is true, then when you move through a space like a condemned mental hospital, how would you move through that space as a visitor? You wouldn't do that by sort of provoking or shaming or right. if you were having, if you had to be on a documentary and you're talking about, Oh, my aunt, right? Like you wouldn't like sort of be like, you wouldn't sensationalize what your opinion of your dear aunt is that suffers mm -hmm. from this disorder and that right. is doing her best uh, to be treated for it. And I think that, of course, like, I think probably like a, 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 a terrible part of those institutions were probably their, their um, unequitable uh, treatment of patients, perhaps, like in a lot of those cases. And so I can yeah. see where that sensationalism will come from about like the sort of negative energy that's built up by this right. mistreatment. But at, at the end of the day, you also, you just have to take a step back from all that shit too. Sometimes. I mean, I experienced it at the Skinwalker ranch, for example, it's, you know, a place that specifically is uh, amplified 
because of its place within a social construct mm -hmm. and with a, a very particular colonial narrative about what tribes do to each other when they put curses on a land and each other, you know? And like, right. like you can't, like a lot of people can't separate what that narrative is that's been put upon it to explain this interactivity with different, very different phenomenon. And the cultural perspective of how that narrative began or what that means. So again, like, multiple things can like sort of be true at the same time. Everything is like sort of complex. There's a lot of conflict and it's just as conflicted as we are as human beings, right? Like not perfect and just trying mm -hmm. to do our best. And that seems like any sort of ghost activity or non-human, you know, inhabitant is um, <laughs> right there along with us as if projected seemingly. Yeah. Who? Um, I'm sorry. So <laughs> Never apologize, Jim. Um, Sorry. So you mentioned Skinwalker Ranch. I have to say, I don't think I know the exact history about that place. Do you mind just briefly going over the significance of Skinwalker Ranch? Like, I think I know, sure. but I'm yeah. not entirely sure. Mm -hmm. So about uh, two and a half hours south of Salt Lake City, Utah, there is a, a Native American reservation of the Ute people in the uh, Unita Basin. Unita Basin. I'm sorry, I don't, I, I can't remember how to exactly um, say that. But essentially, um, the Ute tribe uh, have been put there uh, after the you know sort of um, land was allotted to different tribes, and according to you know, sort of this colonial narrative uh, that is there to explain this interactivity. That land was at one time uh, owned by the Navajo or, um, you know, inhabited by the Navajo. Mm -hmm. And once, you know, this displacement, this great diaspora uh, occurred to these tribes, the land was very much shuffled and, and uh, given to, you know, sort of other tribes. And there was a, there was a sort of a battle for that land. Okay. Uh, according to the legend and the lore, you know, these tribes cursed each other within their, their cultures and, and used ancient practices of, of, of witchcraft, uh, a form of shamanism, uh, using things like uh, skinwalkers, these uh, shape-shifting shamans, essentially, to uh, curse the land. That's, that's that story. Um, I don't know how true it is. You know, frankly, a lot of the indigenous folks there, they don't like to talk about it. Um, and they don't want to share that part of it. And in a, in a way, that gives me great pause as a storyteller in terms of like, well, I think context is important, but like a big asterisk and, and a disclaimer is, uh, is needed. It's required to be yeah. able to like sort of tell that side of the story. Um, and it, like, in addition to that, the phenomenon that is actually happening there mm -hmm. in which the narrative was constructed to explain involves a wide variety of different modalities. So we're talking shape-shifting wolf creatures. We're talking about uh, drone-like yeah, drone orbs that fly around and patrol the area. We're talking about vortexes. We're talking about alien craft. Uh, strange black helicopters, I mean, you name it. Like it's it's allegedly been there. And one of the things that <laughs> sorry, I just saw this comment. <laughs> what, what are we, are we talking, talking about? about? <laughs> I they just joined. That's why I don't know. <laughs> we don't, we don't even know. know. <laughs> we're, just, we're just saying names of cryptids and things. So yeah, zombies and <laughs> uh, intelligent fox people and elves. <laughs> fairies i'm just i'm, I'm not talking about skinwalker anymore i'm just saying <laughs> yeah. no, names of things that's what i have heard about skinwalker ranch is that it's sort of this place that just has literally every type of phenomenon happening there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so do you know anything about why like why are these stories so common have you seen anything when you were there uh i didn't see anything myself the person I was with, Ryan Burns, has become a friend. 
and he's experienced a wide range of things. And in fact, like his property, which sits essentially on the Skinwalker Ranch property, it's all within a basin. And so this activity is spread along the basin. It's not contained by any fence. It's a, uh, you know, sort of separated by a ridge. And, uh, you know, his property has been essentially like sort of attacked by the elements this year. Mm. Uh, he had a, he, you know, his little compound there, he had a, a fifth wheel and he had a, um, sorry, I don't know what I did there. He had, he has a fifth well and a, and a shed. And within the last few months, a single lightning bolt hit his fifth wheel and it exploded just completely gone. Oh no. <laughs> and uh, a matter of few weeks ago, his shed was ripped ripped apart by a tornado that landed. Oh my god! So this tornado dust devil again is another like both of these things the the lightning strike and the tornado dust devil are uh, sort of uh, modalities that have been expressed by whatever this phenomenon is in the past and their stories and lore that's attributed to it. So how this all started was that like there was a ranch there on that basin that was owned by a couple ran like a ranch a rancher and his wife and they very much hate his shed <laughs> um, and you know they experience a countless amount of attacks by these uh -huh. entities uh their you know their animals were affected uh there were mutilations uh, allegedly at the, at the compound and uh, essentially it got to a point where uh, this you know sort of billionaire or millionaire Robert Bigelow, who owns an aerospace company in Las Vegas, uh, bought the land, was assigned a contract with the government to put together an actual research facility there on that land to study the phenomenon. Mm, so okay. through a bunch of money th from his, his friend, Harry Reid, uh, a lot of money was popped in that place to officially study it. And so at this point in time, it's owned by an independent businessman they're doing similar studies, although that they, uh, they don't have any access to the previous studies that existed because they're off in a vault somewhere because it was yeah. uh, it was, you know, a, a private company. Right. So we have no access to that material. And uh, there's a lot of controversy about not just the former owner and his relationships and what he did with information, but the current owner, just in terms of the UFO and and cryptid Twitter Twitter sphere. There's, of course, a lot of controversy surrounding them as individuals and their TV show and, and all of this. So um, all to say, in my opinion, being, being at other sort of notoriously haunted spaces where, and having experiences myself, which led me to question, well, if this is true, what else could be true? Uh, I think there's a absolutely like an incredible potential that people are experiencing things there in a wide variety of manner. Uh, what that is and why, not sure, and I don't know if we'll ever know. But I do have a I do have a feeling that like I'm not that I need to go back, and I don't know yeah. what that means. But I just feel like I need to go back, tell a little bit more of the story, and figure out like what some of the truisms are there with out judgment right um how big is skinwalker ranch do you know how big is this basin um trying to think of like i have actual numbers in my head because at one time i did is it like big oh yeah or it's a big piece of land yeah it's like uh you know football fields and football fields of land i mean it's okay. many, so many, like wide... many 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 acres and in fact, I think the phenomena itself, you know, that basin is subject to it outside of the ranch. And so that's that's probably, a, you know, a few miles of activity. Okay. And in fact, the stories expand um, all the way down into, you know, sort of Navajo country down towards Ship Rock and beyond. So, you know, there's, you know, into Arizona and, and New Mexico. And so that whole section of land, it, it seems that there's some sort of uh, enhanced level of magic and activity going on that is uh, not too dissimilar to what people experience at Skinwalker Ranch itself. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, okay, cool. Well, thank you for explaining that. Um, 
So my next question, little, not really much of a tangent, but I, I, had, I had mentioned this to you earlier. Um, the more, okay, so when I, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I had always thought or imagined um, ghosts and spirits was a whole separate thing from aliens and ufos like i kind of categorize them separately but then the more that i learn about the paranormal and the about ghosts and spirits and the more i learn about aliens the more i learn that there's actually a lot of overlap which um is fascinating to me like i think i was talking to brian j cano on my podcast and he had mentioned that um he was talking about some sort of demon that somebody saw at a place that he was at um, and he was like, they described this demon as like a tall, skinny, gray kind of figure. And where else have you heard that description? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. aliens. So right. they're all kind of like of the same stuff. And I, mm -hmm. that, that's something that never occurred to me. And so I wanted to ask you what your thoughts on that were and what mm -hmm. um, overlaps you're familiar with. Yeah. Um, well, the deeper you go into either parts of that seemingly disparate phenomenon, the closer the connections become. Mm. So, for example, with, um, you know, the, the the alleged extraterrestrials, right? Like, you know, there's a lot of individuals that believe that there's many, many races that exist of, of aliens. Okay. And that uh, the, the small grays or the tall whites... Uh, are are just but one that there are you know reptilian aliens that there are nordic looking aliens and they're called that they're called the nordics and these are sort of tall uh are they the ones Anglo, that like, just look like swedish people yeah or yeah yeah yeah. People, yeah 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 oh, okay. like they're just tall white people <laughs> with like silver hair uh right. you know and then and then there's like and then it like sort of dips into like sort of more ethereal beings, like angelic figures. And so, you know, a lot of folks will experience uh, loved ones in flying saucers, for example, or UFOs. Flying saucers. Like I took it back to the 1960s there. I've got a little bit of Ray Fowler in me. Yeah. Jim. <laughs> in the um, UAP. <laughs> Wait, so they, they see their loved ones inside of the UAP? Yeah, with them. So, you know, that classic. Um, I'm scratching my nose a lot because of allergies, not because I'm on Coke or something. Everybody. Um, <laughs> put it out there. Just need a powder um, in your nose. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so, you know, you, you have those, like, experiences where folks will be on, like, sort of the operating table. And they'll wake yeah. up and they'll kind of be, like, foggy. And they'll – that, like, classic interpretation. And then they see, like, the big head of the, you know, gray alien, like, looking at them. There, there are stories and occasions out there that – folks will report to see like their grandpa come up to the table and be like, it's okay, son, you know, like, Wait, so the grandpa and the aliens. Yeah. 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 Uh, there's others that feel like that they've seen, you know, you know, ghosts and ghosts and relatives and aliens are one thing, but you got to think about cryptids as well because yeah. there's a variety of reports of like sort of, this uh, intersection that exists between UFOs and Sasquatch and that the, the locations what? typically where Sasquatches are mostly witnessed are also locations where UFO activity is the highest. And that just like, you know, how Joe, uh, Joe, whatever his name is, sees grandpa yeah. and the gray alien there are on occasions where they see a Sasquatch working with the aliens as well. And so Interesting. that's all to say that like the, the popular conception of what most people see in any of these experiences revolving extraterrestrials are really sort of simplified yeah. in terms of what is really going on there. Now there's been a tremendous amount of study bridging the gap between uh, things like near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences and alleged abductions or contact with different intelligent lights. You know, um, there's a whole consciousness, consciousness movement 
with experiencers called CE5, where they believe that they can meditate and focus and communicate and bring UFOs out of the sky. Oh, um, is that the guy? I forget his name, but like he yeah, does a Dr. bunch of stuff in Joshua Tree. Dr. Stephen Greer. Stephen Greer. Yes. I almost yeah. went on one of those trips and then mm-hmm. I had to like work. But yeah, oh you my should. God. I mean, it's, it's, Have you been? It's, it's fascinating. No, I haven't been. But I've done it before with a with a with an experiencer and I've been in the presence of others doing it at like sort of a, a very active UFO location. So, I mean, it's it's fascinating that that's when you start developing a spiritual relationship to this as well. All bridging right. consciousness as being the kind of thing that connects all of these experiences and all these different uh, modalities. And so, you know, I don't know if that's real. I don't know if that's true. But the more I dig into it and the more sort of experiences that I have personally with this stuff that mm-hmm. I can't deny it happening, um, it starts to feel very similar to Right. Yeah. The I mean, I, I I also feel like a part of it is me learning more about what paranormal actually is. Because, like, you know, back when I was like younger, I was just like, ooh, like I, everything I thought I knew was just from movies and TV shows. Mm-hmm. And then the more you actually dive into it, the more you talk to people who actually know about this stuff, you realize, oh, TV and movies don't get it right at all. <laughs> It's totally just like a, like right. miseducate miseducating us. Is that a word? Sure. Sure. Um, we do have a question from I don't know this username. I must ask, what would you think would happen if other beings were to come to us and all that? How do you think that would affect our daily lives? What do you think, Jim? Well, I think we'd have to qualify like what does it mean to come to us, and that right. perhaps they already have. Right. And according to thousands and thousands of people, they already have. And Mm -hmm. so it's just, it's just because, you know, them coming to us is not within uh, our particular expected form of communication or relationship with another conscious being. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess the question really is, it's like, it's like that thing where it's like, it, what if aliens landed uh, on the white house or something, right? Right. That's, I think that the heart of the question there and independence day, basically. Yeah. (laughs) Right. And I think that um, what would happen if that happened? I mean, there's been a lot of studies out there about like what the social uh, consequences would be of something like that, like a mass disclosure or invasion event. And there's been a lot of money pumped into like what that would do to society. And uh, you can look those up if you want. But I think at the end of the day, if we, have learned anything about ourselves based on 2020 it's that we react to things in unexpected ways sometimes yeah and we're also very influenced by narratives that are not our own right Mm -hmm. and so i think it would really depend on what the spin was like i can't interpret like what that would be because you would have to know the backstory of how it would be uh placed right well i have a question um especially especially when you consider the technology that we have right now with deep fakes, Photoshop, literally anything can be faked. And, you mm-hmm. know, so I'm wondering like if we were to have solid proof that these extraterrestrial beings were here, whatever, like if everything that we think about aliens ends up being true and mm-hmm. they come here, would we even believe it? Like I, you know, like I think that's I, I, a great question. I don't know if we how would. would we know. How would we know if it was even real? Because I feel like now more than ever, we live in a time of doubt where it's just like, like, like everything people can't even agree dark. that COVID is a real thing. Like, exactly. So how can we agree on like aliens visiting? We probably <laughs> wouldn't. I mean, it's interesting wouldn't. because I mean, we had soft disclosure like in 2017 and it continued this year. I mean you know, this is this is information from the highest levels of, of government that is saying, yeah, that's our footage for UFOs that we took and we don't know what they are. And maybe they're vehicles from another place with non-human inhabitants or they're well, not of this earth. Did they say that, do they just not know 
it did, is that just the American government? Because it could be like from other countries, but like nobody knows what they are. That's, that's a fair point, and it's possible. Yeah, I mean, and I think that's. Um, I mean, listen. I mean, I think like, I think Americans, especially like our um, chief en- engineers, that would know maybe the difference of the highest level of like what technology we inherit. <laughs> Uh, they they would probably not say, I think. And the ones that have like an inkling are probably pretty close, you know? I mean, I don't know. It gets into like a whole big thing about do you believe TTSA and do you believe the military um, soldiers and pilots and everything that have come through and shared their stories. And I, I really do believe them. And I do believe that sincerely they are looking at seemingly technology that they can't explain and that they feel like very almost instinctually that other countries wouldn't have it. But Hmm. there's a whole level of conspiracy theory there, like very, very like (laughs) layers and layers and layers that go back decades um, that are constantly evolving that say that, yeah, we've had this stuff forever. And that like the Nazis developed it because they were doing occult practices and then they channeled a being because they knew how to do that. And then now they're in Antarctica and you know, you're (laughs) yeah. So it gets very, yeah, it gets very deep very quickly. And, um, who, who the fuck knows? (laughs) That's how, that's how good I would be on the paranormal show you're on if I was on it. I would just send everything with. The fuck yeah. Well, they wouldn't have you because they want they they want everyone to yes and the clips. <laughs> <laughs> they don't like any uh, debunking. Right, right, right. Nazis in Antarctica. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, eliminate all of them. Um, so I have a question. Um, what do you? Wait, maybe I don't have a question framed. Uh oh, I have questions. Oh, you don't. I've got questions for you. Go for it. (laughs) I can't help myself. This is what this is what I do now. I just go to sleep and I think about questions. Guest Jim. (laughs) I I don't care. This is my (laughs) show now. Welcome to Night Drift, everyone. (laughs) Presented by Euphemet. Uh, yeah. So, would you ever become? like an actual investigator, like a paranormal investigator with like, uh, you know, devices and stuff going into haunted locations Funny to find the that. truth. I maybe I, I might cut this out when I post this on YouTube, but I Ooh. may or may not have an opportunity to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but here's the thing. <laughs> I, okay. So I have never gone on a professional, professional uh paranormal Mm -hmm. investigation with all the equipment and stuff reasoning is a lot of the equipment that is used it can very easily be tricked and fooled by something Mm -hmm. else so um an emf meter is a very common thing it measures the level of electromagnetic fields in an area because electromagnetic fields equals potential uh paranormal uh, entities, whatever. It, it just means that there's like electro electromagnetic energy there. Mm-hmm. Those things can also pick up that from an outlet from your phone. It can, you know, mm-hmm. go off for a n- number of reasons. Mm-hmm. So to me, I'm like, not really, uh, not reliable. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing, uh, spirit boxes, you familiar with those? Mm-hmm. Okay, so spirit box, uh, has like a bank of words and it picks up the audio levels in the area. And then when it hears something that sounds like a word, it'll shoot out a word and it'll be like box, death, whatever. Um, that again, like it, it's, uh, depends on what this machine thinks that it's hearing. So again, that's not very reliable in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, yeah, just like every single thing I'm like, I can see why someone would use it, but it's just, I don't personally trust it. The only mm-hmm. things I do trust actually are people who are the tool. Yeah. <laughs> wow. People who are tools, um, yeah. <laughs> people who are their own spiritual device, because sure. I, 
uh, machines, like and people who use like apps and stuff. I'm just like, that's the least reliable thing because you can easily program an app to react in a certain way or mm-hmm. give you certain words that you want because there's a lot of spirit box apps. Yeah. Um, anyways, that's my. Well, that's why was so. <laughs> I mean, that's so, so interesting. The last time you were on Night Drift it was a couple weeks ago, and I was editing it all day, actually. So it feels like we've just been talking all day long <laughs> in like bits, you know. And but, but we had uh, we had Stephen Williams on, she was, is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he was the tool in that. Yep. And so, you know, he was a uh, he calls himself an intuitive investigator, and he uses no devices. He just goes in these places and uses himself and his uh, his inherited bil- abilities. Yeah. to, you know, sort of, yeah, mediate these conversations or these relationships with, uh, he would call them earthbound beings mm-hmm. uh, in order to, you know, let them know that they can pass over if they want. They don't have to. He was like very like, I, I really liked his style because he was like, well, you know, this is some of your options. You know what I mean? Like you can, but you don't have to. We're not going to force you to go anywhere. And It was so, cool. I liked him. He was just yeah. super chill. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I get what you're saying. I mean, I've never done an official investigation either. I mean, I've walked along with him while while getting tape. But I just like, there's something about that that feels like a great divide for me. Like, I feel like it would affect my ability to tell this. Because I'm not an investigator. I'm not even really a researcher. I'm just a storyteller. I'm a documentarian. And so mm-hmm. I come at it from, I think, a different place than a lot of investigators do, even though I get pulled in that direction a lot because I want to know more. You know, you just, right. as a curious person, I'm sure you're the same way when you get into a subject that like really, you know, ignites your curiosity yeah. and you start going like, oh, I get it. Like maybe I'm a real deal researcher now. <laughs> and you're like, you are, but right. there's still a difference between, I think, like what we do well, no. s- someone had brought up a term that I actually really like, um, mm. paranormal historian. Oh, interesting. I yeah. liked that. I, th- mm-hmm. um, I feel like that applies to both of us because mm-hmm. most of my quote unquote expertise is purely from listening to people's stories. It's yeah. not from me going out and like experiencing the things for myself. It's just like mm-hmm. listening to what other people have experienced and then basing my knowledge like off of that. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody called me a paranaut. So like, like an astronaut, but like an astronaut or like a, um, what's, what's the other form of it? Um, a psychonaut, right? Like, so someone that like sort of doesn't affiliate with any sort of belief system, but just is out to sort of explore and take mm-hmm. things in and then deliver the message from it. I never heard of that. That's kinda, it's kind of interesting too. Do you identify with that? I think Do so. Do I identify as a psychonaut? <laughs> I think so. No, paranaut. Like, <laughs> Because okay. there's like a nomadic quality to it that I really dig, I think, right? Like, you know, you're kind of like in between worlds and like you don't have to have any answers. You're just yeah. trying to be there and, you know, I like that. Yeah. No, I feel like um, it's, yeah, it's good to be curious. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. I feel like once you stop being curious, that's that's death. That's the end. Because it's just like, Curiosity is what drives um, your everything. <laughs> yeah, definitely the end of our Patreons. That's for sure. What? <laughs> that's what that would be. The end of curiosity is definitely the end of our show. That's exactly. What that yeah. We're not. So. Yeah. It'd be a little hard to phone these things as these these things in. Oh, my friend. Um, I have to say hi to Jay. Hi, Jay. <laughs> um. So we are coming up on the hour. Um. Is there anything? else anything pressing on your mind jim that you just need to say (laughs) Mm. that you need the people to know nothing pressing i mean i guess like (laughs) what what's like really fascinating to me now or not fascinating that's a dumb way to describe it i just i've been i've have felt so so uh grateful for the community that's being built up around independent podcasting and these projects that we all have working on. And I love to see like our community coming together even closer. And I feel like there's a, there's, there's a group of us that are like very big fans of each other's work and we're like rooting for each other. And in that, I think our listeners, we have a lot of shared listeners too, and a lot of shared like patrons and things of that nature. And so they, you know, I don't want to speak for them, but I think I can say like, 
that's a good feeling when you feel like everyone is like sort of rooting for each other and want to do good work. And there's a, there's an earnest, uh, an earnestness to that and a friendliness and a sense of curiosity and wonder that I, I'm just so appreciative for right now. So. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And, um, it's a, I, I, I don't think I was like officially in the paranormal community until like maybe on, no, actually, you know what? I, I've been doing, I keep using air quotes. I've been doing paranormal content for year, like a couple of years, but it really wasn't until I quit my last job that I felt part of the community. Cause I feel like I was just in my own weird little bubble where I was like, I'm just doing my show. I'm getting my paycheck. I don't really care. But then yeah. now that I quit, and I'm like doing my own thing. I'm like, I want to reach out to people. I want to like be, I want to be a part of it. Yeah. No, <laughs> I mean, you're out here in the wild west. Right? Yeah. There's a bunch of hustlers trying to make it happen. Yeah. And it's honestly more fun that way. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you are looking at this chat, but just like a bunch no. of people came. <laughs> um, somebody who, who rated, do you, are you familiar with Twitch and raids? No. Oh, so a raid is like when somebody is What's streaming. Your Twitch? Are you for real? <laughs> I was like, God damn it, Jim. I gotta start from the beginning. Um, so like if someone is streaming on Twitch and then they end, they mm -hmm. can do a raid on um someone else's channel and they send all of their followers. Do we get raided? Of, yeah, so all of the people watching their stream goes to this one. So we've got so a do we have to start people. over? Is that what we're doing? <laughs> exactly. Hi but everyone! Welcome to Night Drift with, with Jim Perry. <laughs> no! Taking over the show. <laughs> um, hour wait, who is Sessions with Mia? Mia K? Oh, Sessions with Mia K. Who is? Who is that? Because now I. Oh, oh my! How many people are with us right now? Nineteen. Yeah, That's wait. awesome. Sessions with Mia K covers mental health topics. Oh, very cool. Oh, well, hi, Sessions with Mia K. <laughs> oh, no. Add an extra hour to the stream. <laughs> well, Jim, are you free? Because, like, I don't got to go anywhere. We can keep I'm, talking. <laughs> I'm free for, like, a little bit longer. Yeah, I mean, again, the you allergy medication know. is still, like, creeping in now. But, like, I took a Benadryl. Okay. I was trying to time it. So it's, like... All right, I'll you take it a little bit before the show. <laughs> and then you let it cut, and I just kind of like fall. I have a no. mat on the floor here. I want to see that moment. Like we're just talking, and all of a sudden you just do it. <laughs> yeah, well, I think you might see it now if we can. Yes. Um, well, you let me know when you need to leave. Okay. I'm more than happy to um, keep going for like a little bit. When you see my screen just go black, you'll know. <laughs> and I just oh. won't even say anything. What kind of channel are you guys? Thank first of all, thanks sessions with Mia K for rating. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, this is my channel. I'm Sapphire Sandalo. Um, I, oh my god, I, I blanked. I'm like, what do I do? Um, I well, this particular show is Ouija Wednesday. So every Wednesday, I bring on a friend and we talk about whatever is spooking us. Uh, and today we're talking about. What did we talk about? We talked about aliens. We talked about Skinwalker Ranch. We talked about um, how paranormal investigative tools are all a sham. Um, yeah, we're both podcasters. Sapphire does this great show called Stories with Sapphire. It uh, are these features, like really intimate features that also present and feature a lot of Filipino lore, which yeah. is extremely new to the paranormal genre because we just we don't have a lot of diversity right now. And it's something that like yeah. is a struggle and something we're working on. It's something we talked about in the last hour a little bit. And I'm Jim Perry and I host a documentary podcast called Euphemet. It's a show about the unknown and a relationship to it. It features. And it's um, fucking great. Oh, thank you so much. It features documentaries with people that uh, have had their lives transformed really by the unknown and the different ways that they're internalizing that or how the unknown has transformed their lives. We talk to people like, um, like people who identify as, as vampires, right. And who live that lifestyle and who, at the end who of the drink blood, like that kind of stuff. Oh yeah. So, you know, like vampires are like a real subculture of people, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forget. I think it was dark tourism. Are you familiar with that show? Mm -hmm. yes. He did an episode on them. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so uh, Balthazar, the 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 vampire that I featured, is uh is in that episode of Dark Tourism actually. So he was the one like the one he was following that actually did the 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 blood yeah. consumption and everything else. And so that's who I followed. But th- the reason I wanted to follow Balthazar was not just because he was a vampire, but because of his personal story. Um, yeah. Because of his human story, and that's that he essentially was living in new Orleans during hurricane Katrina. Uh, after it happened, he basically converted his vampire house, which was a, you know, a group of vampires Mm -hmm. into a community, uh, organization. And they essentially like every day they were out on the street feeding homeless during hurricane Katrina and like, not just the homeless, but anybody was impacted by it. And so that became their full time, job during Katrina. And so it's stories like that that I'm really fascinated by and the stories that I'm trying to get. I'm not just trying to tell spooky stories. I'm trying to tell Mm -hmm. stories of transformation through the paranormal. And so I love that. That's why I love your show. Because it's just like, you know, you can only be spooked so much. (laughs) It's true. A lot of people get spooked out. Honestly, a lot of people that love paranormal, right? Oh, wow. Thank you. Appreciate that. Sorry to put that up there. (laughs) Hang on a second. I pick up my dog because she keeps clawing at me. Lola, okay. Here. Come here. You can't. You're a bitch. She like was jumping up on me, and now that I'm trying to pick her up, she like runs away. I'm like, okay, whatever. So have uh, you? I got yes. a question for you. Have you ever had like a uh, an interest, or have you had like an animal psychic talk to your dogs or give <gasps> you like a reading? No. Have you? No. No, but uh, I I want to, and I know people that do that. Uh, you know animal I mean, psychics? Y- well, secondhand. Who- oh, got it, got it, got it. Yeah, secondhand. Um, and it, like, it keeps coming up on Night Drift. Like, it keeps, like... So, for those of you that are new, like, during quarantine, I can't do my show because it involves traveling out to these locations, so I'm doing an interview show on Zoom called Night Drift. And a lot of the conversations that are happening, we just come around to like sort of animals with psychic powers or like what animals, uh, their positions with it. There's Lola. This is Lola. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> um, yeah. So like what their inherent power is. Cause like, I even noticed myself that like, you know, my cat will show up at like very conspicuous times and like sort of, before like some great idea, like great idea comes into my head or um, some sort of life change or something yeah. like the cat like shows up and uh, more often than not, she like sticks to her own business until these times occur. And so uh, that even happens during night drift. Like she'll basically stay away until we start talking about this kind of thing. And then she shows up. She knows. Yeah. Yeah. She can sense it. So there's seemingly like there's something to it. I wonder if anyone listening to the show has had anything to do with a pet psychic or if you think. Yes. Any that... pet psychic stories? What's the, the, the concept of a pet psychic is very interesting to me that somebody um, can sense like just animal spirits. Like to me, I feel like it's all the same realm. Yeah, I Unless think so. I'm wrong. Yeah, I mean, I think that like when we we asked Stephen about that, and he said that there's been experiences where you know he's communicated or had contact with uh, animal Animals. spirits as well. Yeah. Work, so, or maybe like a pet psychic is just someone who maybe they prefer to read for animals. I think so, and probably have like all of the history behind like what it means right because there's you know volumes and volumes out there well there's there's one really particular like really well-known book about the um what animal like animal meanings right yes if you have a vision or you're frequented by an animal like a mantis or an owl like what does that mean right did you see mantis uh no but moths are like a thing so moths are a thing that what did you say well, okay. so m- moths will occur like every once in a while with like a synchronicity that I have. And so that's kind of like what inspired the moth logo for Euphemet was just oh. that kind of anecdotal, weird little synchronicities that occur with them. 
so, uh, one just happened uh, two days ago. What happened? So I have a good friend. He was on a Zoom chat with one of his friends, and they started talking about John Keel, and they started talking about Mothman. And mm. then his friend was sitting there, and a moth, as he was talking about Mothman, came out of nowhere and just landed right on his lapel area. Whoa! And so my friend immediately like sent me a picture of that, like text me like, dude, this just happened. I was looking at my phone. I was like, wow, that's awesome. I looked down at the sink because I was doing dishes at the time. And a fucking moth just shows no. up. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> so Wait. like in the kitchen, what? like, I don't know why a moth's in there. Like, it's not like a thing. And it was just this huge you know, fat moth that just showed up. And so, yeah, things like that will just happen sometimes with moths that are just like mm, weird. And I know other people that have that with mantis, for example, like you bring mantis up, like that's one of those. My family, every single time somebody dies in our family, we see a praying mantis and Whoa. we think that um, they're connected. Like, um, so my dad, when he goes back home to the Philippines, um, or wait, sorry, let me start that over again. Um, I think it was like a couple of years ago. I think he was back in the Philippines because of his brother's funeral. And then I think in the same year, his mom also died. I think I might mm. be wrong. Um, and so he got to their house and there was like a praying mantis up on the roof, like near the front door. And they were like, oh, we never see praying mantises here. And then they just like ignored it. And then like, I think later they noticed that there was like two. And those two praying mantises stayed in the same spot the entire time that they were there. Whoa. They never left. And yeah. so my parents were like, oh, we think that it might be my grandma and my uncle. Mm. And then um, when my grandpa passed away like a month ago. Um, oh, sorry. He, no, it's okay. Yeah. Um, the day of his wake, I was in my parents' backyard and this like really cool brown praying mantis just like showed up like on the table. And so I like took a picture and then um, my mom sent me a picture of another praying mantis that showed up like uh, last week or something. Cause my dad's friend in the Philippines died and it showed up like on the same day. So it's like praying mantises apparently just show up when people die. I don't know. Unreal. And yeah, I, I looked at the Phoenix and um, apparently like praying mantises are a sign of like, needing to oh no i forget i should i'm not gonna say yeah that's <laughs> okay i mean parent pr praying man is also have like a connection to uh, a, a potential like sort of alien being what and so yeah you should look up the work of Stuart davis he Stuart does like davis. a really interesting uh he does a really interesting podcast i think it's called like alien and me maybe but he's He's been a podcast guest on a few different occasions uh, and has expressed like these really interesting uh, connections to, you know, uh, extraterrestrial beings and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and like, yeah, look at them. I don't know. Right. Oh. I'm not trying to judge a praying mantis, but they look kind of I... alien like. I mean, they're weird looking. I the, What was kind of cool, though, is like all the praying mantises that we see are like kind of like unique and like different. And the, the one mm -hmm. that showed up on the day of my grandpa's wake was like this really cool brown one with like, spots. And I had never seen a praying mantis like that. It was really mm -hmm. cool. That's amazing. Um, wait, what was the other? What did I want to bring up? Oh, moth. OK, so there was like a week where I noticed that bugs were just drawn to me and i don't know if you know what this means and i hope you do so you could tell me but like okay so i'm terrified of spiders but i started like i was sitting on the couch and then a spider was just crawling towards me and usually like i kill them but now i'm trying to like not kill <laughs> random insects that like aren't doing anything so i like scooped it up and then i put it outside and then like a couple days later i'm sitting on the couch and i feel something like on my arm and i look and there's a spider and like I didn't, I'm terrified of spiders, but like, I didn't freak out. And I just kind of like, Whoa. I went outside and just sort of like brushed it off. Yeah. And then I was like watching TV and I see this like moth sort of just like fluttering in front of the TV. And I'm like, okay, little moth, like do your thing. 
And then it fucking flies over to me. It's like hovering right here. And then it lands on my arm. And I was like, does it? I was like, what does this mean? And so I, I like nice. slowly walked outside to like brush it off my arm. Whoa. But yeah. I think the moth thing happened around the time that my grandpa died, I think. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if like that meant anything. Cause I looked it up. I was like, what does it mean if a moth like lands on you? And I think I saw somewhere that it means that like somebody's about to die or like whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, there's a strong connection to moths and, and, and death, you know, and as a part of that ritual. So it's interesting. I don't know. I have, I, I don't know if I've, um, I don't know if I'm familiar with the phenomenon with bugs in particular being attracted to people in certain times and what that means, or if there's like a swarming. It was weird. It was um, so weird. But, you know, there are, there are reports of, um, that's how my brain works. Cause it has just so much like anecdotal shit in it. <laughs> and listening to our bell. There are occasions where people will experience that with like crows, for example. Yes. Like, they'll mm -hmm. feel like, Oh my God, I'm being followed by a flock of crows or have those experience with, with dogs or cats. Um, just an increased amount of, of like sort of being stalked or followed or warned or something like some people would think that they're a harbinger or that there is a deeper sign there of maybe something that hasn't happened just yet. So yeah, crow. I speaking of crows, I just watched The Crow for the first time last for night. The first time? The first time. That was one of my favorite movies as a kid. Oh my god, it is the most 90s movie I've yeah. ever seen in my life. Totally. Like the fashion, yeah. the editing, oh my god, the music. I was just like oh god. I am like teleported back in time. But it the the idea of um the crow like carrying your soul to the afterlife like yeah mm -hmm. that's a thing like a, a lot of different birds mean different things in like a lot of different cultures simply because birds fly in the sky they're messengers they like mm -hmm. are the connection between down here and like up here so yeah um yeah birds hold like a lot of significance too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um one time my parents they we're just like in their room and all of a sudden there's this like little brown bird that like showed up and they were like looking around and like all their windows were closed and we're like how did this bird show up and so they're like taking photos of it and then they like try to capture it and they like eventually do capture it and then my mom goes out to like buy a cage for it and it's oh no, no 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 she had an existing cage yeah because my parents my dad likes chickens and birds and like shit like that so we had a cage and they put it in <laughs> And then uh, my mom went out to go buy like bird feed for it so that it could be like their pet because they're freaking weird. And then like my mom came home and then she looked in the cage. She's like, where's the bird? And they look around and like they can't figure out how the bird escaped. And so my mom and this is when my mom texted me and she was just like, I think that it was a spiritual bird that visited us. It wasn't like a real actual like physical bird. Whoa. Um and then I told, oh, I looked it wow. up. Yeah. And so like, I asked her, I was like, what kind of bird do you think it was? And then my dad's like a, like a bird nut. So he knew it's like a California towhee or something. So I searched to see if there, that means anything. And like, it's a type of sparrow. And so when a sparrow comes to visit you, because sparrows are so small and they need to uh, protect themselves from predators, mm -hmm. if they show up, it is usually thought of as a warning sign that like danger is coming oh, and so i told wow. my mom that and she was like you know if we had known that um we probably could have prevented something from happening uh that happened like a couple of days later and it was like something they didn't even tell me happened and i was like yeah okay wow. but yeah so isn't that insane. wild <laughs> that's so insane yeah wow yeah, that like seems very personal for me. Um, a couple of weeks ago, my father-in-law passed away like really suddenly. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, thank you. And like the next day, I found like a dead bird in our bathroom. Oh wow! Like, you know, I think the cat was the cat, right? Again, like <laughs> she knows had something that. to do with it. But yeah. like, you know, I had to have this experience of like wall in grief over his death. Like, have to go in and um, like I put gloves on right like i didn't want to like just scoop it up so i like put like some plastic gloves on and i went and like just picked it up and then took it outside like wrapped it up in like some cloth and then i 
I just took it outside. But like, it was very interesting to have to like confront that. Right. Like, it it felt big. like it was like, yo, yeah. like you're going to have to, cause I was like displacing a lot of it. I was like trying to like not think about it. I was trying to put it aside and just like, to be that like kind of macho thing where it's like, well, I didn't, you know, I'm fine. You know what I mean? It's about other people right now. And I didn't have a moment for myself. So that really like snapped it into me and yeah. allowed me to, to take some space. And yeah. That's really interesting. Do you, um, do you know what type of bird it was? It was a swallow. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. So I wonder what it means when, um, yeah, what, I wonder what that means. Yeah. If wow. anything, but it, but here's the like here's the crux of it. Like whether these things mean anything at all like per uh, uh other anecdotal evidence, uh research been done, uh history or lore, however many books it is, if it allows you to break out of your habitual stance right and allows you to go oh, i need to like take a moment and think about things for a little bit and internalize things then that's what it means that's what yeah. it is and maybe yeah. that's just as simple as it is you mm -hmm. know yeah and, and and to bring it back to paranormal and everything it's like when someone tells us something that happened to them it's the story itself that or the story has meaning because it has a meaning to the person that yeah. it happened to. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. if it was true or not. It's like that was an experience that was real to them. And so like, mm -hmm. who are we to, <laughs> you know, tell them like, actually it was just the pipes or like right. whatever. Right. Right. Or, and you know, it's such a good point because I think, you know, we are kind of joking about people like getting like all spooked out or whatever, like another scary story. And I think, I think why that is, is because like as humans, we want to be able to connect with people on a, on a, on a much deeper level than just like sort of titillation or entertainment. Yeah. So when it's just like, well, this one thing happened to me and it was real weird. Like you can only take that, like so many of those kind of stories, right? Like for, and they, they are what they are and they are for what it's worth, but without, discovering what like sort of the fundamental change that occurs within our states of being because of this stuff mm -hmm. that people can connect with and see themselves in. I mean, that's where, that's where this stuff becomes transformative and helps people feel not alone, you know? Yeah, I agree. Um, well, it's 821. I figured, um, that's a good spot to, <laughs> So that you could just woo, drill, up. kicking in. <laughs> oh my god, I I had fun. Did you have fun? So much fun. <laughs> it's always fun chatting with you. Yeah, it it's great. Is, I, Jim, when we first met, okay, I, I mean, obviously, every, I'm talking to everyone in the chat, but um, you like came over to my house and like we immediately were just like talking about like I don't even remember what we we're talking about, but I just remember being like, yeah, like you know how there's just some people that you like vibe with right away. And like, mm -hmm. I felt like you were like on the same frequency right away. And they're like, I love that. Like, I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, we it didn't have to be a lot of like, it, yeah, that, I don't know what it is. I mean, some people like, and it's maybe like we're, we're really close in age. We probably like come from like the same, um, sort of pop culture upbringing. <laughs> so there's probably a lot of just like common, like touch points within that. Like, sure, yeah. so there's that, but it's also like, um, I think because of our individual work, right? Like you can tell a lot about us within the shows that we do. And I think in that way, I already felt like I knew you a little bit. Yeah, and I think maybe you felt like I knew like, so I think that was it. Yeah. It was like, yeah, yeah. We like already know each other. So yeah. let's like, start talking about other stuff. That's so true. <laughs> yeah. That's actually really interesting. And like, I, um, and I feel like that applies to, most people that work in the paranormal community, I feel like this, like even when I'm meeting new people, the second that they mention something about a ghost or like something about paranormal, I latch onto it and I'm like, who let's talk about that. Cause I feel like it's such an easy like way to like, I don't know. I, I feel like it's you, you get deep with it. Like, I don't know. Like 
I don't, I'm not sure I'm explaining yeah, myself. Yeah, no, well. you do. I mean, it's what it's the reason why I suck at like going to parties and stuff because I only like, want to talk about ghosts. I only want to talk about ghosts and weird shit and like get deep. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then, and then of course, like fair amounts of joking and like being weird and stuff. But like, yeah, it, it's like base level sort of conversation feels yeah. like such like a story. Oh, such a slog right. to get there. Like, it's like, ugh. what do you do for work? Ugh. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, the what do you do thing. I hate I, yeah, it. Because I question. never, I don't know how to answer that. I'm like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> how, do you, how do you go there without completely showing all your cards too, right? Exactly. I mean, there's that. Like, there's this whole element of what we do that is kind of like still very on the fringe. And so it's kind of like when you want to introduce yourself to new people and not be like completely judged right away you want to kind of like go in soft with it like right what's your podcast about you know what i mean (laughs) matt oh maddie's one of my um patrons oh heck yeah jim can come to any party of mine man i love doing convo parties yay oh my god matt's awesome so on or with my patreon patreon members i um watch paranormal connie camera with them and it's so funny because like after every video, Matt will be like, oh, I've seen something like that. And so in the commercial break, you'll like tell the story. And I'm just like, what the heck? <laughs> Sounds <laughs> like Matt should be on the story. I know. On the show, yeah. I know. <laughs> Matt, what are you doing? Um, and, oh, 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 somebody also is asking you, Jim, do you have a Twitch and or your YouTube channel? Neither. I just have a podcast. Well, where can they find so everything y- that you so thank you for asking. Uh, my podcast is called Euphemet. That's E U P H O M E T. You can find <laughs> it. Thanks so much. Look at that. Uh, you can find it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, right now, there's a lot of bonus content out there called Night Drift. Those are interview shows. I recommend that you go back and look at any numbered shows because those are the documentaries. And actually, just go back to the first and just like start and and see how it works because. <laughs> It's a series. It's evergreen. I think you'll really enjoy it. I loved it. I Thanks. remember listening to the first episode while I was running. I think it was the one with um the the girl who found the notebooks of her dad who wrote about like a exorcism or something. Yeah, right. Yeah, and I just remember I was like running and I had to like stop. I was like, whoa, <laughs> that was yeah. really good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then it gets like real sad, and then like and then you feel good about it and. Yeah, yeah, I really love that story. Oh, yes, yeah, thank like, you for asking. Deep paranormal shit, like there is, like truly, is not enough of it. Like truly. <laughs> no, yeah, and that's where our place is. It's about like, yeah, just like that tiny, tiny little niche where we're like, we take mm-hmm. this very seriously. <laughs> yeah, well, and like we'll see it. Like, can like honestly, more people are sort of like wait as more people are are like sort of coming to the party now, like more people within yeah. the ability to give like TV shows or mm-hmm. different opportunities are now like sort of waking up to unsolved mysteries, like being a hit again and them taking phenomenon like very seriously or John who tried to contact aliens as a short on Netflix, like being mm-hmm. very, um, you know, taken seriously and being yeah. a very heartfelt, thoughtful piece uh oh thank you so much yeah you like the vampire episode yeah thank you i mean that was one of my favorites to produce not just because of meeting that one yet yeah it's fun i mean like i gained 10 pounds on that trip i think because it was in new orleans (laughs) and i ate so much muffaletta and beignets Mm. and just gumbo it's not good can't live there (laughs) Glad I don't. All right. Um, yeah, that's a good place to end. <laughs> I'm the worst host ever. Anyways, um, Jim, so great having you. So great chatting with you. Always a good time. Thank you. Uh, if people want to follow you, stay up to date about what you are doing, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me on all social medias at It's Jim Perry or oh, at Euphemet. Uh, on the rest of them. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm on Instagram the most, so that's probably a good one to follow. Cool, me. cool, cool. Yeah. Um, sweet. Uh, you. Oh, if you want to watch me live tomorrow, 
I'll be on Facebook Live with a couple different co-hosts interviewing Rupert Sheldrake on his Professor Rupert Sheldrake on his breakthrough study on non-local consciousness, how it affects our reality, and something called morphic resonance, which is a very fascinating uh, idea about how we're all connected subconsciously. <gasps> We are, though. Yeah, so 11 a.m. Pacific time tomorrow on Facebook. Join us okay. for that. Will it be available to watch later? Mm, no. I'm going to burn it right off of social media afterwards like a <laughs> bad Mission it. Impossible tape. <laughs> yeah, probably. I got to set up a YouTube or a Twitch like these kids are doing nowadays. You do. With the video games. <laughs> oh, man. All I'm right, just well... going to play Counter-Strike on it. And it'd be like, this isn't empathetic paranormal <laughs> stuff at all. Like, this is like headshots with a bow. Like, what is going on here? Crossbow. I used to play games on my Twitch, and people were like, why are you doing this? Just tell us stories. And I'm like, I want to <laughs> do other stuff, guys. God. I'm a full human. Exactly. All right. Okay, sorry. I keep going. No, you're fine. Well, uh, thank you, everybody. Everybody who came from the raid, thank you. That was like so random. Thanks, Sessions with Mia Kay. Um, and thank you, everybody who stuck around. Okay, bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. <laughs>